you together today. Thank you for joining us online, those of you who are watching at home as well. In worship, we surrender our agendas, our checklists. We find rest. May this time of worship give you peace and help you experience the loving presence of our Lord Jesus. Just um, a couple announcements today. Wendy is hosting a family movie night on Friday at 9 o'clock. I still believe it be a great movie to watch and fun to be together spread out in the parking lot. Uh, some students and parents are going canoeing tonight in the Cheyenne River with Scott Tickey and John Samuelson leading, so that'll be a lot of fun. Nice that we can do those outdoor things together. We want to say hello to those who will be watching at the Cheyenne Care Center. Good afternoon, I believe, to Irene and Mavis, Lorette, Diane, Kyle, and Shirley. I'll open with a Father's Day prayer. Blessings to the dads who are here to today and those who are at home. God's strength and love to you as you parent. We give thanks, Creator God, for the fathers in our lives. Fatherhood does not come with a manual, and reality teaches us that some fathers excel while others fail. We ask for your blessings for them all and forgiveness where it is needed. This Father's Day, we remember the many sacrifices fathers make for their children and their families, and the ways, big and small, they lift children to achieve dreams thought beyond reach. So too we remember those who have helped fill the void when fathers die early or are absent. Grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors, coaches, and the women of our families. For those who are fathers, we ask for wisdom and humility in the face of the task of parenting. Give them strength and guidance to do well by their children and by you. In your holy name, O oh God, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, change your posture if you're at home. As we begin worship today a little bit different way, we begin with a confession written for the commemoration of the Emmanuel 9, the beloved of God who were killed at the close of a Bible study five years ago at the African Methodist congregation in Charleston. We remember their lives, and as a church, we confess the sin of racism and condemn racist rhetoric and the ideology of white supremacy. We pray, God have mercy. God have mercy. As church, we confess, repent, and repudiate the times when this church has been silent in the face of racial injustice. God have mercy. God have mercy. Racism is deeply ingrained within our church, the ELCA, a predominantly white church. It is embedded within individual congregations whose members continue to foster stereotypes and support policies that actively hurt people of color. God have mercy. God have mercy. As church, we declare that the enslavement of black bodies and the removal of indigenous people established racism in the United States, a truth our nation and this church have yet to fully embrace. God have mercy. God have mercy. Rooted in slavery, racism is manifested through the history of Jim Crow policies, racial segregation, the terror of lynching, extrajudicial killings by law enforcement, and the disproportionate incarceration of people of color. God have mercy. God have mercy. As church, we lament the institutional racism of discriminatory treatment within the call process, inequitable compensation of clergy of color, racial segregation, divestment from black communities and congregations, systematic policies and organizational practices, and a failure to fully include the gifts of leadership and worship styles of black people, indigenous people, and people of color. God have mercy. God have mercy. Confessions are empty promises without meaningful actions, actions that are grounded in prayer, education, and soul-searching repentance. The sin of racism separates us from one another. Though we trust that we are reconciled to God through Christ's death and resurrection, we seek such life-giving reconciliation with one another. 
As we repent, let us not turn back to ideologies that promote white supremacy. We trust that God can make all things new. Amen. Amen. We'll join together very in worship here, softly singing or humming the moving hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Jesus Christ. Let's join together in the prayer of the day. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to ask for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture readings. The responsive reading is from Psalm 139. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. My body was not hidden from you. While I was being made in the secret, I opened my to Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to me. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. The Holy Gospel according to Acts, the ninth chapter. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus 
so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from the eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus and immediately began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God, the Gospel of the Lord. Alex and Jack, do you want to come up and talk to me a little bit today? All right. Good morning. It's good to see you. Hey, how are you? You having a good summer so far? Is your sister coming too? Here she comes. I want to show you this page in this book. I'll show the kids that are watching at home too. See this picture? What do you see in the picture? There's a horse. I see a bright light. What else do you see? The sun. Yeah, it's really shining, isn't it? It's shining so hard that he can't see anything. No. Want to read the story? The temple leaders were jealous of all the people following Jesus. They had put many in jail. Some were killed. The believers were especially afraid of one man. His name was Saul. One day, Saul was on his way to arrest Jesus' his followers in Damascus. Suddenly, he fell to the ground, blinded by a brilliant light. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you attacking me? It was Jesus speaking to him. Wow. For three days, Saul was blind and did not eat or drink. On the fourth day, he had a change of heart. And he had someone come and visit him. That we'll talk about more soon. Saul was baptized. He changed his name to Paul and he wrote many letters to encourage the new churches in many faraway places. Many people asked Paul questions, including
including what was most important to God, Paul answered, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Wow. So Saul was a bully, and he became the greatest teacher and leader in the church. It's like God is playing a joke on God's friends. Hopefully you're too little to know any bullies yet. Maybe some of the older kids watching have had a bully. Bullies can be really hard to deal with. But it doesn't make things better to be mean back to the bully. We can ignore the bully or try to make the bully our friend. I did. I did. I did. Good to have friends, isn't it? Well, God kind of plays a joke on God's friends, the Christians. It's a great joke that God can do something they thought would be impossible. That this mean bully, Saul, he becomes a wonderful teacher and preacher and helper. He becomes so important in sharing the good news of Jesus. God changes his heart. I have a little something to help us remember how God can change us. So I put in here a piece of paper, and I wrote on it, Saul. Because that was his name. Hmm? And I think sometimes maybe we think God can't change our hearts, but God is always working and changing and we are all called child of God. And even Saul, he gets a new name. He's called Paul, and he's called child of God. Isn't that neat? God loves us, and God loves Saul very much. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Give us faith, hope, and love. You do amazing things in our lives. And all God's people say, Amen. I think I have some starbursts for you, and there are some bulletins to color and have fun with, too. It's nice to see you today. I made you back. Yeah, there's some maybe's on the back. Okay, why don't you pick what you would like? Just pick one. Okay, find a red one. Beloved of my heart and God's heart, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. What has brought you to your knees? A vigil at the hospital bedside of someone that you love, a child, spouse, parent, maybe the unexpected death of someone that you love. What has brought you to your knees in your life? Maybe it's happier things, a marriage proposal, the many times that you bend down when you care for a child, tying their shoes, a band-aid fix up after a fall, bedside prayers. Maybe it's the joy of winning a big game. America has been brought to our knees across political and geographic and racial boundaries. People of all ages in cities and small towns are kneeling to acknowledge that discrimination and racism are real problems and are determined to bring about change. There has been a shift in perceptions and attitudes as more people realize that too often people of color are treated differently, treated as less than by others, especially those who hold power. Parents have been talking to their children, and as Reverend Jim Wallace writes, this time feels different. It truly seems to be a culture-changing moment, not just a passing media story. As rallies and protests and conversations continue, momentum is building. The time has fully come to finally address and change the racially flawed structures of our society for the soul and safety of our nation. So the slide is up. I think Brandon saw it in the video. Let me focus again on closer up. 
But I want us to notice this image of Saul. He had a life-defining moment that happened when he fell to his knees, too. There's another image in art that Julie will flash just for a moment. This one is the most famous painting, Carvaggio, but it's not very biblically accurate. There is not a horse in the Bible story, but maybe it's a metaphor that Paul has been riding his high horse and now he's been humbled by the light of God. But the other picture, the more simple one, we'll keep that one up. That is what happens in the story today. Saul is on his knees. So the gospel has been going out for three years now. It's been three years since Jesus returned to heaven. And Peter and the other disciples, Philip and Bartholomew, they have been creating new churches in Samaria and Judea. And the Christian church is growing, but it has been experiencing great persecution in this time, as it still is in some places today. Saul is highly educated, and he is a very devout follower of the one true God. He is a very faithful Jew. And he is on a mission that he deems from God to terminate the early Christians. On his way to find Christ's followers in synagogues in Damascus, he is blinded by this light from heaven, and he falls to his knees. The Lord Jesus appears to Saul and speaks with him. He is without sight for three days. He does not eat or drink at all during that time. It's a time to think, to pray, to reflect, and to make a life change. During this time of darkness and introspection for Saul, Hananias is given a task from the Lord. And if you've ever had a nudge, and if you've been a Christian for a while, I think you have, maybe if you've been a new Christian, you've noticed this too. A nudge from the Lord to pray for someone that has hurt you, to sacrifice something, whether it is limited leisure time to serve someone, to stand up for someone, even if it's the hard thing to do, when you know it's the right thing to do, then you can relate to Ananias. When the Lord asked Ananias to go and pray for Saul, to place his hands upon him that he might regain his sight, he doesn't want to go. He knows exactly who Saul of Tarsus is and the harm that he has done to the early church. He has heard many reports about this man, and he tells God, don't you know who this is? All the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem? He has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Why do we sometimes feel the need to tell God something God most certainly knows? But we all have done it. Ananias' perception of Saul was correct a few days before, but it is not on that day. Ananias knew what every Christian in his town knew, that Saul was at Stephen's stoning, Deacon Stephen's stoning, the first martyr, known martyr of Christ's movement. How Saul has been dragging off women and men, putting them in prison for associating with Jesus, desiring their deaths. They are rightfully afraid of Saul. Ananias doesn't know that Christ has confronted Saul on the road and blinded him. Preacher Wesley Allen points out that Ananias' decision to go to the home on Straight Street to lay hands on Saul is a decision to risk his life to do the will of God. To risk his life to do the will of God. The result of that reluctant leap of faith is that Saul's eyes are opened and he is baptized, and he becomes part of, and eventually a key leader in the very church that he sought to wipe out. We don't know anything more about Ananias. But he trusted that God had a future plan for Saul. And because of Ananias' actions, we have Paul, the one who chose the one who Christ chose to proclaim the gospel to the whole world, to found churches and urban centers across the Roman Empire, to stand true to the gospel when he was on trial time and again 
and end up in house arrest in jail in Rome awaiting trial before Caesar. Precious few of us are a Paul or a Moses or a Lydia or a Deborah, but we all can be like Ananias. The Lord needs us to be like Ananias, willing to listen to Christ's voice and heed Christ's word. Maybe you want to be a braver follower of Jesus, but you think, I don't know much about the Bible or church. I have had a lot of mistakes in my life, harmed my family. There's things that I haven't forgiven myself for. How could God forgive me? Then we remember that none of the people in the Bible are perfect. Far from it. Except Jesus. Only Jesus. The purpose of the scriptures is to show God's faithfulness despite the people's continued unfaithfulness. When Christ enters our life, and we give the Holy Spirit room to work, we become a different person. God looks at us and sees Jesus. We are still the person that God created with unique gifts and abilities, but all that stands in the way of our relationship with God is washed away. Our resentments, our pride, our failures, our expectations, they're removed. We are able to begin anew, alive in Christ Jesus, made flawless in Christ. God calls ordinary people to his mission. None of us can do great things, but we all can do small things with great love. That's one of Mother Teresa's most well-known statements. And I think it's quoted so frequently because it's true. And so often, we forget the most true things. None of us, not all of us can do great things, but we all can do small things with great love. Sometimes we forget that we belong to God, and that we have each other, and that we each have been given a holy calling in our baptism. God loves this world and seeks to care for it and sustain it by working through us, his people, God's vessels. Cracked as we are, we hold miraculous love, the light of Jesus Christ. And so our ordinary tasks, the repetitive things that we do in our daily life, they can be ways to bless others, to make this world more trustworthy, loving, healthful, the people that you live with, the people that you work with, the people that you interact with most frequently, those are the areas that God can most utilize your love, your energy, your time, the gifts that God has given to you. We can discuss things with our children, like how to treat others, how to notice one another's gifts, how to understand our feelings for the glory of God. We can prepare a meal for our, our family or for another to the glory of God. We can give a dose of medication and a healing touch to the glory of God. We can fix a piece of machinery or fence to the glory of God for the goodness of God's creation. The ordinary places of our lives become holy ground for the healing of the world. We all have a role in the building up of the kingdom of God. Like Ananias, we can help God's dreams come true. You can help someone know the love of Jesus. God will be at work through you when you are creating a home, a community, a world where every person knows they matter. They are loved. Where everyone has food to eat and clean water to drink, a safe place to sleep, ability to treat basic medical needs. I love this verse in the hymn, There is a Balm in Gilead. The hymn speaks of Christ as the ointment that heals our souls, our lives. 
And I've always liked the third verse of that song. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus who died to save us all. Oh, there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Jesus is our balm for our healing and for the healing of our world. Thanks be to God. join together in a prayer shared for Father's Day. Let us join together in the prayer. Heavenly Father, you entrusted your son Jesus, the child of Mary, to the care of Joseph, an earthly father. Bless all fathers as they care for their families. Give them strength and wisdom, tenderness and patience. Support them in the work they have to do protecting those who look to them as we look to you for love and salvation through Jesus Christ, our rock and defender. Amen. I'll share another prayer and then I'll just invite, I'll lift up different areas to pray and then we'll share moments of silence as you bring the wishes and thoughts and yearnings of your heart to God in this time of prayer. Almighty God of all creation, we join our voices to praise you today, giving thanks for your grace and care, singing of your wonders, celebrating the joys of life you have blessed us with, family and friends, new relationships and deeper relationships, new life and transformed lives, reconciliation and restoration. We are so grateful today for the gifts of fathers, the gifts of being a father, the fathers that we miss. We thank you for the many ways that our fathers have shaped us, for their example and their love. We pray also for those who have had painful relationships with their fathers, for those who are estranged from their fathers, and for fathers who are estranged from their children. God, we pray for those unwilling or unable to accept the responsibilities of fatherhood. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the well-being of creation. Lord, 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the church, for its ministry, for the mission of the gospel, that we would be filled with joy to share your love with others. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for peace and justice in our world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our nation and those in authority. We pray for refugees and those without a homeland. We pray for the needs of the poor and oppressed, for the ill. We pray for those who are lonely. We lift up to all who are bereaved Surround them with your presence, comfort them with your consolation. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who suffer in mind and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we bring to you the needs of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, loving and good God. We commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Greet your neighbor, wave at them. If you're at home, text a friend, tell them God's peace. Remind them of that God is with them. Christ. We're so thankful for the work of our congregation through all of you, its members, and our staff. Thank you for your gifts to support the work of our congregation. For all who give online and those who mail their checks, those who bring their offering today, let us share together in the offertory prayer. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. We'll prepare our hearts for communion. If you're watching at home, you may repeat the words of institution in real time so that you can experience Lord's Supper today in your home as well. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed our delight and our duty that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their hymn.
betrayed, he gathered with his friends, he took bread, he gave thanks to God, and he broke it, saying, take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and offered it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we do remember. Remember us and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God come for all is ready. All are welcome. together in our sending song. So we can't sing real loudly for the safety of others, but come and get an instrument and make some noise to praise God there in the front pew. So children and children of God that are not so little, you can get an instrument too. nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. May Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and keep you today in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ goes with you. Amen.
Thanks be to God.